Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time that we can be together as a family. We thank you, Father, that what unites us is your, your spirit, makes us all one brothers and sisters, nothing closer than that, makes us one blood, your blood, brings us into your DNA, not our DNA. And Lord, nothing's closer, nothing's better, nothing's more kind and sweet. And Father, we just love you for allowing us the privilege of coming into your house, the house that you built for us by your grace, and you're paying off by your grace. And Lord, we're giving you the praise and the glory and the honor tonight as we come before you. We don't come seeking for ourselves necessarily, even though we do. We come seeking, Father, for your presence. And in your presence is healing. There's going to be people tonight that are healed as you hear the word of God. There's going to be people tonight that are going to leave. By the time they wake up tomorrow morning, Father, I'm asking you that you heal them completely. All pain gone and all symptoms gone and completely cleared up in their bodies, Father. Tonight, Lord, for many that are having economic problems, it's going to be a turnaround starting tomorrow, God. We thank you that you speak over the marriages that need healing tonight. But you speak the word of God to us. Holy Spirit, teach us to be what the Father would have us to be, what the Son paid the price for us to be, and what the Holy Spirit empowers us to be. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We come to exalt in this house the name of Jesus and none other who is our senior pastor and God will give you the praise as you bless us bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet and we thank you Father for a mighty move of your spirit everybody that's in agreement give out a great big shout we are amen thank you very much go ahead and have a seat and bring your Bibles uh, out and let's get ready for the word of the Lord anybody Anybody ever just enjoy the profound words of Jesus besides me? I, I get to think about them all the time. And on Wednesday nights, for those of you that are new, we were getting into the Word of God. And, you know, and, and I have to say this, for a reason, for a reason, and the reason's you. I mean, if, if, if I thought singing and dancing would get you mature and strong in Christ... I would sing and dance, and that would be a miserable sight, but I'd do it anyway. If I thought running out in the parking lot, changing oil in your car, would help you get closer to Christ, I would run out in the parking lot, change oil in your car um, to get you closer to Christ, but that is no work. What gets you closer to Christ is when you evaluate who He is, and you evaluate who you are, and you know that He wants to take you to where he's at. Amen. Can you imagine a God that loves us so much? I want you to hear me. Are you going to daydream and talk? Or are you going to listen to me? A God that loves you so much that he wants you to come close to him. He's the shepherd. And sheep, we sheep that wander off, the ones that are the safest, the ones that are the healthiest, the ones that are the strongest, the ones that end up the very best, are the ones that are the closest to the shepherd where he can guide them and guard them and protect them with his rod and staff. And he can comfort them and bring them to a place where they're fed of greatest food you could get. And when you come and drink of the finest water that you could possibly, cleanest water you could have, that's what a good shepherd does. That's what he does with us. I, I, I think one of his things that I feel has always been a drawback is that he has to work oftentimes through men and women. Uh, and there's going to come a time in all of our lives when he'll speak to us and it won't be from a man or woman. And for some of you, he'll speak to you in your privacy of your home even now. But when we get into church services, he uses the pastoral anointing to do that. And that's why it's important to get under the pastoral anointing. Not just to hear the word, Wherever, you know, you say, I get the word of God here and there and all that stuff. But to get under the anointing, it's under the anointing, you know. 
And um, like we were talking about the music tonight, and Lupi and Danny, and you know, some would consider that to be old school music. I consider it to be anointed music. And, and, and it will someday be gone. We'll never sing those songs again because the church transitions into different things. Uh, and that's the way it is. But, you know, for me, uh, when you hear that old music being played, you know I'm probably going to come up and teach the Word of God because I like to flow in that anointing. Mark, the fourth chapter. Profound words of Jesus. In this case, is called living your life on a pillow. It's kind of wonderful. A lot of times we don't realize when I give a title to that, what in the heck is he talking about? Living a life on a pillow. And you have to see it in Mark, the fourth chapter. There's a couple of ways it's written in different books, but this Mark, the fourth chapter became my favorite this week as I was meditating which of the events to, to teach from. And I want to read you something, but before I do... I want to share a principle for you. To hear the word of God and for me to teach you the word of God and leave it at that would be a travesty and a great loss in your life. Because the word of God is not evaluated on just the different tones that come out of my voice to you. The word of God has got to be evaluated and received through the character, nature, and attributes of God himself. Then the word of God becomes alive. And may I say this to you, that oftentimes I will mention to you that the Old Testament is a reflection of the spiritual principles of the New Testament. The physical things they did, but God never stopped talking to us through the spiritual activities. The woman of the well is a brilliant example of salvation. The parables that he spoke about, if you will, uh, you know, just pick one of them. Let's just say the story of, uh, uh, of the good stewards. There's great insight there about what Jesus is saying. Everything that takes place in the physical in the New Testament is, is a word from Jesus to you and I that confirms the words, do you follow me, of Jesus. In fact, you can go out and the principles that we live in, the way that you take in nourishment and you're healthy and you grow because you take in nourishment. And if you stop taking in nourishment, you would stop growing, wither and die, is a biblical principle, not on how to grow physically, but it's a principle of spirituality. And all of these things that you live in, the birds in the air, the grass that grows, all of that is saying something about the overall plan of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes what we do is we'll teach the word, but we'll leave out the very character and attributes and nature of God and misunderstand. The actions of Jesus often speak as loudly as his words. And a lot of times we don't understand that. And he's playing a role that is evaluated by man and inspired by the Holy Spirit and written so that you and I could see the biblical principle that if we grab that and apply it in our life, all of a sudden we start to make these amazing changes. Life starts to function well. With that in mind, I'm going to read you these verses. I'm going to come back. And we're going to study the verses together tonight. Are you with me? Yeah. So you're just going to, have to pay a little bit of attention. And I think you're going to like it. Here's, here's Jesus in verse number 35, the fourth chapter of Mark. And he says, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Verse number 36. And when they had left the multitudes, they took him all alone in the boats and uh, as he was and other little boats were also with him. Verse 37. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Verse number 38. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, 
Do you not care that we are perishing? And when he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Verse number 40. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now I'm going to take you to chapter number five and I'm going to read two verses. Very important verses for chapter number four. Then they came to the other side of the sea of the country of the Galdeans and when he had come out of the boat immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This man, just to let you know, was so demon possessed they could not tie him down. He was absolutely a wild man. They would put chains on him and he was so crazy, so demon possessed that he'd break the chains off. And that's the very first thing that meets him on the other side. And I want you to just see that this is not just a story, but it's really saying something deep about you. Kind of fun. Deep about you, deep about your life, deep about the experiences of what you're going to experience in order to be the Christian that God's called you to be. And so let's go back and let's go to 35, verse number 35, and let's take a look at it together because for all of us it's so important what's being said on verse number 35. It sets you up for life. And notice what it says. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, that's his disciples that he's speaking to. He said to them, let us cross over to the other side. First thing you notice that the disciples are not arguing. Hey, it's nighttime and uh, we're tired. We've worked hard. And, you know, let me tell you something. When Jesus tells you to do something, you ought to be smart enough to do it. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll hear something from Jesus that doesn't fit exactly our comfort zone. So we argue or we say it couldn't be God because it doesn't fit. Can I tell you something? When God tells you something, most of the time it's not going to fit your comfort zone. Because it's God. And you're following God. God's not following your comfort zone. (laughs) And he makes this statement to them. Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when you see something like that, for most people it just becomes a story. Let us cross over to the other side. But then you stop and you think about some of the Old Testament and New Testament. You will always find that there was something blessing on the other side. Remember the children of Israel had to cross the Red Sea because the promised land was out there on the other side. Then they had to cross the Jordan because they found out the promised land was on the other side. And when you see these words, let us cross over to the other side, it's really saying a whole lot more than just a story about a people trying to get over a river or, or a lake or whatever. It's a story about people that realize following Jesus is going to take you somewhere. And what we need to understand, too, that we fail to see oftentimes is that when Jesus says to go to the other side, you know, we have this American, we have this uh, uh, comment that we say all the time, this little slogan, that grass is not greener on the other side. And we oftentimes live our life that grass is not greener. Can I tell you something? That's a lie when Jesus is involved in it. Because grass is definitely greener when Jesus is involved, taking you someplace. And God doesn't want to just take you someplace without you getting up and going. God is not in the dragging business. He'll leave you right where you're at if you won't do something. You're going to have to, in order to get to the other side, just like these disciples, you're going to have to live a life that says, hey, I'm going where Jesus would have me go. 
And you see, sometimes we don't want to do that because we don't understand that. But I'm going where he'd have me to go. And I've got to do something about it. I've got to get up and go do something. Can I tell you something? I always said this for you know, like how many years in this church? Been, or been 30 years I've been saying this. There is no way in the world that Tinkerbell is going to fly over your head and put dust, uh, gold dust over you and you're going to get blessed by God. If you want the blessing, you're going to have to get up and do something. Are you listening to me? Now, I'm not talking about heaven. You're going to get heaven, but you might as well do something while you're here. You might as well break out of the mold. You might as well not stay the same. You might as well end up better than your parents ever dreamt of having you done. You ought to do something greater. You ought to do something. Why? Because you're going to the other side and someone's leading you there. His name is who? Jesus. See, sometimes we fail to see the simple thing like that. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse number seven, it says these words that are important, that we shouldn't mock God whatsoever. Notice what it says. Do not be deceived. Sometimes we're deceived. And we're deceived in this way. Now watch how we're deceived. God is not mocked. Don't mock God. Don't deceive yourself by mocking God. You say, well, how do I mock God? Watch this. For whatever a man sows, that he will reap. You don't make the effort to get to the other side, you'll never get there. And some of you will say, what happened? Some people I knew got blessed. Some people got their businesses. Some people got their family. Some people got their healing. Some people had happiness. Some people had great marriages. How come, how come that didn't happen to me? Because you're gonna have to get up and do something about it. You know, for some of you, listen, you believe in God for your children. I mean, you, you have a word from God for your children, but you hadn't seen it come to pass yet. That's the other side is where it's coming to pass. You're going to have to do something to get it. You're going to have to do something great to get it done. Some of you believe for marriage. Some of you believe for your finances. Some of you believe for business. Some of you believe for your job. Some of you believe for something. See, everybody's believing for something. My goodness, if you're not believing for something, start believing in something because your God's a great God that brings to pass the things you're believing for. And don't be a stagnant person that says, I expect God to pour out his blessings on me and not do anything. I'm deceived and I'm mocking God if I think I can get away with not putting something in and getting something out. Come on, somebody. See, and so many people in Christendom come into a church like this, sit and stare at the pastor and go to God and say, God, here I am. I did my penance for today. You know, I'm really a good guy. I went to church twice last year instead of once or maybe twice in a month instead of, you know, all the time. And, and, and I expect you to do something. If you weren't God, you're going to have to chase after God. And you're going to have to follow God like these disciples. And on the other side, I promise you, there's miracles. The first thing that happened to him is he came out of that boat and a demon faced him. Now, I want you to just think of your worst relative. Uh huh, that's the one. And he was meaner than them. And he get the devil right out of him, gets him free. In other words, on the other side, which you need to go to, there are miracles. Are you listening to me? Listen, note this before you go running off to the other side that you think is the other side. Let me say that again. Note this, that you don't run off to the other side because you think it's the other side. They heard from Jesus. Let's go to the other side. It wasn't, I have a feeling to go to the other side. Let me tell you something, that feeling... You don't want to follow feelings. You want to follow Jesus. Is anybody listening? We're full of feelings. We're full of feelings. Feelings run our lives all the time. I feel. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you have the ability to hear from God. God will speak to you. I want you there. I want you to do that because there's something on the other side that's going to take care of you. And I've been setting you up for it. Now it's your heart. Now you do it. And when you do it, God will go with you. Now when God goes with you to the other side, funny things happen. (laughs) <laughs> first thing go back with me if you will in the Mark 5th, 4th chapter verse number 436 it says when he had left the multitude and took him alone in the boats as he, as he was other little boats were also with him 
Verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. I, 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 I read that, and I stop and I think, in an adventure of life, going to the other side, there's going to be some troubles. If you think you're going to get blessed by... Now, here's, here's my prayer. God, I want the blessings, but I don't want the fight. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? God, I, I, I want the blessings, but I don't want no trouble. You know, when I was a young Christian, how many of us tried to make a pact with the devil? I tell you what, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. It's a liar, he never left me alone. So I decided to really get him and become a pastor. And, and can I just tell you something? None of us want to fight. Nobody has want to realize something. But there's a lot of things that want to come against you and stop you. There is never anything that you're going to do with God that won't be resisted. Let me say it again. There is never anything that you're going to do for God and with God that won't be resisted. It's just the nature of the whole thing. There is no way everything just goes so smooth that you never have problems. I wish it was that way. I want it to be that way. I want it to be like, you know, when you go to Disneyland and the weather is absolutely perfect and you get right in and you go, oh my goodness, there's nobody here today. Oh my goodness, you're in line and it's, wow, a 10 minute wait to get on Star Tours. What's that all about? Oh my goodness, isn't this great? You get to go eat food and there's not a ton of people in there. You know darn well that has never happened. <laughs> Somehow kind of the good things you got to fight for. Now, I'm not talking about Disneyland. That's not a good thing. That's really hell land. And, uh, and especially if you're a grandpa, you know what I mean? It's like, oh my God, we're going to stand in line another two hours for a five minute ride or a three minute ride. And, and it's just ridiculous. It, 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 it's just, it, what I'm talking about is when you start to cross, you start to set your feet on the ground and you start to take a position I'm going to because I can do all things through 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 Christ who strengthens me to do all those things that I couldn't do normally it'll be God on the inside of me that helps me to get it done so all of a sudden the first thing he says let's cross over second thing you see is there's a storm not a story guys it's telling you what's about you and it tells you about your future. There's going to be a storm. It's not going to be a little storm. It's going to scare the snot out of you. This is a storm that they were starting to sink. They weren't just saying, man, I got wet. The wave came over the top of the bow. I don't know what I'm doing. I just I don't understand this thing. I, 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 it's just, no, this is a storm that scared the pants off of them. And I promise you, that which will mount up against you can only do one thing, get you to fear and scare the pants off you so you stop going to the other side. That's what it's all about. Never has changed. His tactics never change. But if God told you to go to the other side, no matter what comes up, you got to keep on going the other side. You know, and so we don't see that oftentimes. So you see verse number 37, but 38 is kind of a fascinating one. Are we okay with 38? Let's, shall we go to 38? Uh, 38 says, but he, notice the capital H in the word, he's speaking of Jesus. And it says, but he was in the stern you know, why in the heck does he say that? Why didn't he just say, he was in the boat? He says he was in the stern. For those of you, the stern part of a boat is the aft part, the back part of the boat. And most boats that are built today, if you had a center line, that the actual controls of the boat are just a bit behind the center line or the aft part of the boat. Did you know that? Almost every boat out there. In fact, if you had a dinghy, if you had a little rubber boat and had a motor on it, 
The motor is not on the side. If it is, you're nuts. And the motor is not on the bow. If it is, you're nuts. Guess what? All of the power is in the back of the boat. All of the guidance comes from the back of the boat. And almost every boat that's ever been built over that center line is the aft part from the center line back. And that's the stern part where the control takes part. And Jesus, he could have planted himself anywhere. I mean, he's Jesus. Why doesn't he sit in the bow and cover the people so they don't get wet? I I love these people. I'll take care of them. I'm going to sit in the bow and lift up my robe so the water doesn't go over them. He doesn't. He goes back in the stern where he's making a statement by being in the stern part of the boat. He's saying, listen, if you're going to cross over, there'll be storms, but I'm in control. And I'm, and I'm the power of you getting through to the next side where you need to be. Because on the next side where you need to be, there's miracles. How many of you need a miracle? You, you need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle all the time. I need a miracle to get to 72. Come on, somebody. And uh, uh, I need a miracle all the time. And so, listen, I need a miracle for Debbie to keep loving me at 72. And so... Here's the deal. We all need a miracle. We don't realize there's a war going to take place. So Jesus is in the stern of the boat. Asleep. On a pillow. What's the matter with him? Asleep. On a pillow. Ever thought about why he's asleep? On a pillow. And what he's saying by being asleep on a pillow. I mean, you stop and you think about it. Jesus could have been awake in the stern part of the boat, calling out orders. I mean, like, all you little boats that are following me, I care about you. You listen to what I had to say. Come on, gather close because there's a storm around us and let's get together and that way we can protect each other and help each other when this wind comes up and the waves are there. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't just sit up in the back of the boat. He's not just awake in the back of the boat. In the middle of the problem, Jesus is saying he has got some comfort and peace going on in his relationship. We don't. When God sees you with a trial, a problem, a temptation, pressure in life, he is not taking Prozac. He is totally and completely in such control that he can lay his head down on a pillow and be comfortable in the middle of the problem. Why? Because he can instantaneously change the problem. Are you following me? Some of us think our problems are so big. Oh God, where are you? What have you done? Don't you care about me? How come my prayers aren't being answered? God, and we start to question God in the middle of the storm. And that's what these guys do. When in fact, he is so comfortable about the results, he's asleep. He's making a statement. You don't need to freak out. I'm here. How can you be so close to me yet so far from me? Because they got their eyes on the storm instead of their eyes on their Savior. Come on, somebody. Which brings us to verse number 39. In verse number 39, and he arose and he rebuked the wind and they said to the sea, peace be still. Did you know that this is a condition that God is looking for all of us? He wants us to be at peace in the middle of a storm and still. Now, I'm not a still person in the middle of a storm. When I have problems and pressures that are on me, I want to fight back. But he's the one that fights back. He's the one that vindicates. He's the one that promotes. He's the one that makes that which I don't know how to make work, work. And so he comes along and he could have said these to the waves. He could have said anything. Tell me, tell me if he couldn't have said anything. He could have said, shut up. Calm down. Relax. Flatten out. But he makes a statement. 
that he's trying to get across to all of us. In a storm, God can come along and speak as long as you are at peace and still, God will work on your behalf. And what we don't do is we don't follow that at all. We make that crazy statement to him that says, don't you care about us, teacher? Do you not care that we are perishing? He's asleep on the pillow. Verse 38, 39. John, the 14th chapter, verse 27, says these words. He says, peace I leave with you. Peace isn't something you have to find. Peace is something you have. Let me say it again. Peace isn't something you have to find. Peace is something you have. Peace isn't something you have to find. Peace he left with us. All you have to do is get off the storms and get on to him. Because when you're on the storm, you're not on him. And peace is not there. Notice what the scripture goes on to say. My peace, I give to you. Have you ever wondered, like, okay, if you gave it to me, where is it? My heart is somewhere else. That's what's the problem. My thinking is somewhere else. My complaining is, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? In other words, where are you, God? How come you don't come through? I've got a problem here. And God is saying, listen, I want you to be at peace and be still because I have given you peace. And I have done something. I leave it with you. I didn't take it back when I went. I left it with you. Now adapt to the peace. It's yours. You can get it. It's yours to take. And then he comes along, not as the world gives you. In other words, the world settles the problems and you get peace. Look, when I have financial problems, I get peace when I get a hold of some money. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I go, wow, I got the money. Man, that was close. Thanks, God. Peace came now from the money. Hey, when Debbie and I are fighting, which isn't very often, but we do. She's tough. I'm tough. But when she loves me back, then I get my peace. I find my peace... When business is going good, I find my peace when the church is filled. I find my peace when I have a certain position in life. And that's not what he's talking about. That's not the kind of peace. If you're looking for that kind of peace, you'll never find peace, the peace that you need. He says these words, he says, I leave it with you, my peace. And my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. In other words, your peace is not going to come from the money. Your peace is not coming from uh, the solution. Your peace is not coming from somebody. Your not peace is coming from your accomplishment or achievements. Your peace is not coming from your job. Your peace is not coming from, you know, the family being together. Your peace is found where? The one who gave it to you. And that was their problem is they couldn't find the peace and being still in the middle of the storm. They kept waiting for the storm to be settled before they found the peace. Now listen, what would have happened if they had sat down and said, you guys got to be kidding. We've just seen a bunch of miracles from this guy we're following. He's back there sleeping. He knows what's going on. I don't know how anybody can sleep during these size waves. And we'll just, you know, relax and throw the water overboard that comes in to the best of our ability. But we know God will take care of us. Let's all be at peace. Do you think God would have let them drown? Not a chance, my friends. Not a chance. What's going on here is going on here for you. So you can see that you can't get your peace from the stuff you're looking for from to get your peace from. If I get my education, I'll get my peace. If I get that job, I'll have my peace. If I buy the house, I'll have my peace. If I have a better house than anybody can ever imagine, I'll have my peace. If I get that car, I'll have my peace. If I get that you know, money, I'll have that peace. If I have a wife, I have a children. And we're looking for peace everywhere except in him. And that's what they did. They were looking for the settling of the storm for their peace. 
And he says, peace. Go back, if you will, to the fourth chapter. He says, peace. Be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. You know, just that is that how fast God can get you out of a problem is that fast. No, it's something about it. You know, you don't know how big my problem is. You don't know how big your God is. Well, man, the doctor said I'm in stage four cancer. I'm not going to live any more than 30 days. I want you to know something. God only needs one second. So why should you give up 30 days early to his one second? Wouldn't it be horrible if you got to heaven and you found out, hey, listen, I was going to do that in the next hour, but you, you, you already gave up on me. Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great. How many realize there wasn't a, a, a you know, Debbie and I are sailors, or were sailors, and um, still sailors. And uh, Debbie and I have been in places. One of the frustrating things about sailing is you don't sail very good if there's no wind. Southern California doesn't have great wind. And um, so we like to get out there and turn the engine off. It has an engine. Debbie calls it the iron spinnaker, which is a type of sail. We turn the engine off and the winds hit the sails, blow the sails out, and then you don't hear anything but the water running by the boat. And it's like, oh, and then the dolphins. Really quite a cool. I am, I, I'm definitely not thinking of you when I'm out there. <laughs> I, I actually go out there to stop thinking of you. <laughs> and so here, here's this, the wind ceased. So there was a great calm. And sometimes when there's no wind, it's frustrating. It doesn't frustrate me as much as does Debbie. I mean, I, could, I like sailing so much that I could sail at a half a knot. One knot, maybe two knots. That's not very fast. You walk four and a half. So that's not very fast. I like sailing. But Debbie, oh no. Man, gee. Turn the engine on. Oh, this is ridiculous. Turn the, anything under five knots, turn the engine on. And so I said, well, why don't you just buy a speedboat or something, you know? It's like, let's settle this issue right now. But here's this great calm. That means the sea's flattened out. God will take care of your problem instantaneous. Whatever your problem is, family, children, finances, whatever your problem is, school, work, past problems, whatever your problem is, God will take care of that fast. And, and you say, well, then why doesn't he? Waiting for you. Because you're still looking to the problem to be solved for the peace that he gave and left for you. And if he solves the problem by eliminating, solves the, gets you the peace by solving the problem, then you will always look to the problem to be removed instead of God's presence. Is anybody listening? I mean, it's so cool, isn't it? It's so cool. Now watch this. With verse number 39 comes along something really kind of cool. It takes place. Uh, verse number 40. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? Where'd they get the fear? They got the fear because they were looking at the problem. And when you have fear, it's opposite of your faith. You see, because the proof of your faith is whether you're in rest and in peace. If you are rest and in peace, you are in faith. But if you're in turmoil and you're in fear and you're just hoping God coming through, it is not faith. And he says this, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why? Because their heart was now fixed on not the God that was asleep in the stern. That Listen, I, 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 he's asleep in the stern means I got your back. <laughs> and they don't have their eyes on the God that's asleep in the stern. They got their eyes on the problem, hoping the problem will get away so they can find the peace. And that's the wrong kind of peace. Is anybody listening? And it's so important for us to see these things. So what we do oftentimes is we are a people that have more 
interest, knowledge, and more emotions and more heart towards the problem than we do towards the God. And so he comes along and he says, why are you so fearful? I'm with you. I got your back. I'm asleep in the back. And my goodness, how come you don't have any faith? Because you got completely off of me. And now your confidence is in this storm wiping you out. And when you do that, you void out the very thing that God's all about for you. Which brings us to 41. They f- <laughs> and they feared exceedingly. In other words, the fear they had for the storm, now they're fearing who they're with in the boat with. Should have started that way, but you know what? You started that way. Maybe they didn't start that way, but you started that way. Who are you in your boat with? Who do you have your faith on? Who do you find your peace through? And how much stillness can you have in the pressures? And he says these, they feared exceeded, when they feared the other way before in the problem, but now they're fearing God. And he said to one another, who can this be? And that's probably the cry of most people that call themselves Christians. Who is this God? Because we don't know him enough to put our faith in him in the midst of a problem. That even the winds of the sea obey. Can I tell you something? Listen closely. The very thing that he created, every bit of it, he controls. And we forget that all the time. The very thing that he created, the, the, the power of a wave is bizarre. It has taken steel freighters, steel ships, and broke them in half. Waves are so powerful, it's taken uh, uh, everything. It's just wind has blown planes out of the sky and, and houses off the ground and tore bridges down. And, and, and I mean, this, these two probably most powerful features on the planet, the water and the rain, which we don't consider. If you lived in Louisiana, you would. He controls. And he speaks, bang, and they obey it. You walk out of here tonight, man, you're not alone. You got your back covered. You got some place to go. And you shouldn't worry about the storms that are going to come. It's not maybe they'll come or maybe they won't. They will. The pastor needs to tell you the truth. You're going to fight a battle, but you're going to win the battle. You're going to get on the other side and you're going to have a miracle. And my friends, those are profound words on how to live life on the pillow. If God spoke to you today, come on somebody. Tell him, tell him, tell him. Tell him better than that. (laughs) See, sometimes we just read our Bible and think, oh, that's a great little story. Yeah, a story. Slap yourself. God's trying to tell you something. And he, his body language, speaks loud. (laughs) Ever been with somebody you can tell where they're coming from by their body language? Oh, what kind of day they're having? Huh? How about Jesus? He's got body language too. Isn't that good? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. All of you that are leaving, you shouldn't leave. It's probably the part of the service that's for you. And the devil's running you out of here. Just hold on a minute. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me tell you something. If you're not right with God, I've told you the truth all along. I'll tell you the truth right now. You're going to die and go to hell. We've watered that down in American churches because the truth be known is that preachers oftentimes, not all the time, oftentimes are more afraid of the people than they are of God. But in this church, we're going to say it like it is. If you're not right with God, if you're not born again, you're going to die and go to hell. And someone needs to tell you, you don't get born again because you think of yourself as a Christian. No, no. 
And you don't get born again because you're a nice person or a good person. No, no. You don't get born again because you came into this church tonight. That doesn't work at all. You don't get born again because you went to seminary, graduated and got a pastor in front of your name or a reverend. You get born again because you gave God all of your heart and gave God all of your life. That's what this is all about. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's about one thing and it's about your heart. In fact, Jesus in the boat, in the back of the boat, in the middle of the storm is really about the heart of those disciples and about your heart. Everything is about your heart. Everything. And if your heart's not right with God, then you're going to die and someone needs to tell you and go to hell. But tonight, you can change that course. Tonight, we're going to pray. And we can include you in that prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior. We can do that. We can include you in that prayer. Some of you need to be included in that prayer. You know who Jesus is. Of course, you wouldn't be here, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You celebrate Christmas every year of your life, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You celebrate Easter and know about the resurrection, but that does not make you a Christian. Your mom and dad told you you were a Christian, but that does not make you a Christian. You're not some other religion. You've already been christened or baptized as a baby. That does not make you a Christian. It does not. You have to do something to be a Christian. You have to make the effort to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's entirely what the Bible is all about from the beginning to the end, that you would make that kind of commitment of all. You say, if I give all, that's radical. Yep, it is. All means all. Giving God all of your heart. Giving God all of your life. We refuse in this house to water that down. I'm more afraid, and so is every pastor on staff. We made sure of that, of God. We're afraid of God a whole lot more than we are, whether or not you come, whether or not you give your money, whether or not you like us. That isn't the issue. The issue is we know God comes, and God likes us, and he pays the bills of this place. Tonight is your night to get right with God and give him all of your heart and all of your life. If you'd like to be included in that prayer, then I'm going to ask you in a moment to raise your hand. I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'm going to go bang. And you hear that sound with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Bang. Your hand goes up and I'll see your hand go up. Put it right back down. How simple is that? We're going to give you the gift of privacy. Nobody will look. Nobody will know. Don't look around. Don't stare at me. I see some of you. Put your head down, close your eyes, please. Be respectful to the other people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna to count to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure about really where you're at as far as giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Maybe you're in this place and you're saying to yourself, I gave him all of my heart and life. I prayed the prayer at a Billy Graham crusade or harvest crusade. But I'm not sure I really followed up. You didn't. If you have questions, you didn't. God looks at your life to see if your prayer was real. And tonight you can make that commitment of all of your heart and all of your life. You're born again, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell and will include you in the prayer But Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But I'm a man, I'll see it. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. If you want to be included in that prayer, I'm counting to three right now. Just pop your hand up and then put it right back. Let me see it. You say, if I do, I'll be embarrassed. No, you won't. Nobody's looking but me. Why wouldn't you want to do this? He wants to give you his peace and leave it with you. You need it. All across this auditorium. Are you ready? I'm counting. Get ready to pop your hand up. One, two, three. 
you. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Keep them up. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Six back over here. Thank you. There's seven back here. There's eight. Thank you. There's nine back over here on this side. Anybody else? Real quick. There's nine. Nine wise people. Anybody else over on this side? There's ten. Thank you. God bless you. I see you. There's another one. Eleven back, back here. God bless you. I see you. Anybody else? There's eleven really wise people. I think I already counted you guys in back row. Go ahead and put your hands down. I think I already counted you over here to my left. I think there's 11, maybe 12. God bless you. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody open your eyes and face me. All 11 or 12 of you, I want to include you in the prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to get out of your seat and meet me right here in front. Now, wait a minute. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Bring a friend. Check with your neighbors. Say, I'll go with them. They might be one of those people that raised their hand just now. Tell, I'll go with you if you need somebody to go. Tell them, get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Now listen, you're going to the other side. If you're going to go to the other side, you're going to have to do something. You're not just raise your hand, but get out of your seat and meet me right here in front. You won't be embarrassed. We'll pray for you. And you're going to get right with God. And tonight is your night of salvation. So let's all stand and welcome them as they come. If you didn't raise your hand, you know you should have. You can come too. Come on, come, 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 come. I surrender all. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. you didn't come some of you didn't raise your hand and came thank god you did listen put a smile on your face this is a good thing you're not gonna die and go to hell i mean this is a good thing you know this is like the best thing you ever did in your life this is like party time man party you know so this is good. See this guy over here, he's going to pray with you. His name is Pastor Joel. Really, really neat guy. Give you some free stuff. I mean, now that you're going to become a Christian, what to do next is very important. You're going to be saved going to heaven, but you've got to live here on earth. Don't you want to know how to live it prosperously, successful, happy, fulfilled? See, if you want to know that, it takes a little bit of effort. You're going to the other side. You're going to have to get in the boat, go to the other side, even when you don't want to. He'll tell you some things that will help you a whole lot and bless your future. You need a future that's blessed. Not one that's in the past that's been cursed, but one in the future that's going to be blessed. We'll help you get there. Is that all right? Make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over here. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.